Um, so first of all, thank you so much to the NYC Media Lab for having us. My name is Nadia, and this is my co-founder, Star. Um, Hi. Uh, Star will be back for the Q&A after I tell you a little bit more about our game. So um, we're both artists, and we come from a combined background of theater, illustration, photography, writing, and graphic design and comics. Both of us are excited about interactive media. So a few years ago, we combined forces to create a company called Aconite. The goal with Aconite is to use emerging tech to tell stories in new ways. Our first title, Hollow Vista, launched in the fall of 2020 on mobile. The goal with this talk is to showcase the gameplay of Hollow Vista and to dissect some of the techniques we use to create player immersion. So what is Hollow Vista? Hollow Vista is a mobile game that uses mixed reality to make the player feel as if they've traveled to new locations without actually leaving the place where they are. We'll break down the gameplay experience feature by feature, but to begin, I'd like to play a short trailer showing the overall vibe of the game. Okay, so, wow, thanks, thanks guys. I haven't even gotten to any of the interesting stuff yet. Okay, <laughs> um, so Hollow Vista is a social media simulator. The entire game plays out on a fictitious social media app resembling Instagram, and the story takes place a few years into the future. You play as our protagonist, Carmen Razo, with your device acting as her phone. Carmen is a recent graduate who just landed her first job in a mysterious architecture firm. And through Carmen's eyes, you discover a dangerous project that this firm has been building in secret. You experience a week in Carmen's life through the places she goes, the people she chats with, her social media feed, and the photos that she posts. So, um, the social media app in our game has a camera button, just like Instagram. When you hit the camera button in our game, it opens to a virtual camera. Every time the camera opens up to a new scene, it's meant to convey that you've traveled to a new location in the story. You can look around the scene in 360 using your phone's gyroscope and accelerometer. You're given a list of objects to photograph in each scene. This is meant to put you in Carmen's frame of mind as she documents the various places that she visits. So the camera gameplay is one of the most immersive parts of Hollow Vista, and there's a neurological reason why. Most people are familiar with the five senses, touch, sight, taste, smell, sound. But there's another very important way that we experience the world, and that's proprioception. Proprioception is a neurological sixth sense. It's your awareness of yourself in physical space. By giving people full control of how they view our environments using the same motions and gestures as they would when examining a real life scene through their regular phone camera, Holovista engages the proprioception area of the brain, making people feel as if they're physically present in the environments that we've built. 
So another technique for immersion in Hollow Vista, whoops, um, another um, immer technique for immersion in Hollow Vista, sorry, I'm having a little bit of issues with my deck here. Give me one sec. Great, so, so the other technique that we drew on heavily is to draw on existing design patterns from social media apps. All of us are used to scrolling through a feed in order to learn new things about our friends. It's practically muscle memory at this point. So when players explore the game's social feed to learn about Carmen's world, that act felt so familiar to them because they're doing it in their da daily life every day, that the story uh, felt immersive very quickly. Similarly, using a very familiar interface for chat created a sense of instant connection between the player and the characters in the game. We found that adding that so-and-so is typing animation especially created a sense of suspense and engagement, though we also gave our players an opportunity to skip it. So now I want to show you a little bit of gameplay footage to explain how posting to social media works. So in this scene, Carmen is in the bedroom of her small Brooklyn apartment, preparing for her job interview. She's nervous, so she's taking photos of objects that she finds familiar. She's going to post these photos, photos on social media with captions that convey various aspects of her character. We found that by adding a simple puzzle here, we really increased our players' engagement with the story. So we also found that having likes and comments pop up as a kind of reward for solving the puzzle made people read those comments very attentively. So the way that this puzzle works is you're presented with this UI to add a photo. Once you tap it, you're presented with a caption that Carmen wrote. And here you have to match the right photo in your camera roll to the caption. We also added an option to filter the photo, but that was purely for aesthetic player expression reasons. So here's an example of that puzzle right now. You're asked to add a photo. You see Carmen type out her caption. You pick a photo to match, and you add a cute filter. And once you post it, you're rewarded by uh, people's reaction, very similar to real life social media. So another one of our immersion techniques was to use glitch effects. Without spoiling the story too much, because I want you all to go and play the game, I can reveal that at some point, Carmen's mind begins to really unravel. Um, so at that point, the game turns up the volume on the surrealism and introduces glitch aesthetics to underscore Car Carmen's diminishing control over her environment. Objects begin to float in space or appear on the ceiling. Doors vanish. Glitchy flickering, pixelation, melting, and color channel separation in the environments, and eventually in the game UI itself, really underscore the brokenness of Carmen's reality. So the final immersion technique that I'd like to mention actually takes place completely outside of the mobile app. Um, so throughout the game, uh, if you really paid attention, there were subtle references to things like websites and usernames that exist in our world, not just in the game's world. For example, if you were to zoom in on Carmen's offer letter from Mesmer and Braid, the architecture firm that hires her, you'll notice that there's a phone number. Um, calling that number leads players to a transmedia experience that plays out on TikTok, YouTube, and the World Wide Web. If you never discovered this rabbit hole in the game, you could totally enjoy the whole experience from start to finish. But if you did you find yourself going down that path, it added a whole new layer of context to the story. So we launched this alternate reality game ahead of Hollow Vista to promote it, but we also made it possible for people to access it once the game had launched through the game itself. So what I'll do now is play a short video to give you a sense of what that experience was, because it was a whole game in and of itself. Okay, hold on. In the summer of 2020, a mysterious architecture firm invited the curious to take a collaborator assessment test on mesmerandbraid.com. The test held up a mirror to the participants, assigning them new collaborator identities. Access
Whoops, technical issues. I'm going to restart that. One sec. In the summer of 2020, a mysterious architecture firm invited the curious to take a collab collaborator assessment test on mesmerandbrain.com. The test held up a mirror to the participants. Collaborator identity. Accessing the company portal to build the document, the collaborators discovered the secret history of the firm's team's legacy. a treasure trove of historical records, thanks to the discovery of an ally in unlikely On this TikTok, urban explorer with a username Corbett49 stumbled onto an abandoned Facebook question group. The wonder is urging his new friends to visit the memo voicemail in the newspaper clipping they found in the company's archives. Urban in turn helped them back with each unearthed object, even a picture of boundary nature, betrayal, and a matter of minutes, what was once a potent piece of literature exploded into a viral phenomenon. Hey, Nadia, um, can you, the audio is a little bit low on the video. Can you narrate and, and walk us through what's, what the, um, the sound on the video? So um, up until this point, we've spent a lot of time talking about the game mechanics, but I'd like to shift the focus onto narrative to explain how it relates to the mechanics. Hollow Vista is a very emotional story about a young woman coming, in terms, coming to terms with her past. We felt that social media was an interesting container for this type of story because we get to see Carmen putting on her best game face for the outside world through her public posts while at the same time struggling in private with her inner demons. In terms of the environmental storytelling, Hollow Vista is a story about memory. Specifically, it's a story about a woman exploring her own memories through physical space. You explore opulent rooms in a large mansion built by Carmen's new employer. But what Carmen doesn't realize is that the mansion that she's in adjusts to fit the occupant. In a covert psychological experiment gone awry, we watch as Carmen's fears, secrets, wishes, and memories come to life in the form of progressively surreal environments. In the next few slides, I want to drill down deeper into the visual language of Hollow Vista's environments and characters, but I want you to remember this idea of memory and physical space, because we're going to return to it at the end of this talk. Hollow Vista relies on a robust taxonomy of repeating objects, colors, and motifs. For example, each character in Hollow Vista has their own color scheme and set of symbols that represents them. These symbols show up in the house that Carmen explores, revealing her feelings about each character and about herself. So Carmen, our protagonist is blue, a reference to blueprints, which are important to her as an aspiring architect. It's also a reference to the ultramarine shade that painters traditionally used to represent the Virgin Mary and not to Carmen's Catholic upbringing. Carmen's mentor and friend Jazz is represented by the color green. Jazz is accomplished, confident, and stylish. Carmen suffers from intense insecurity when she compares herself to Jazz, which is why the color of envy is associated with her in the game. Carmen's sister, Inez, is a fitness influencer. Carefree, active, and spiritual, Inez feels most at home in the ocean surf, and thus her color is aqua. And finally, Carmen's best friend, Vlad, is represented by the color red because Carmen and Vlad share a not-so-secret mutual crush. Vlad is one of the most positive forces in Carmen's life, and red represents luck and passion. 
Moving on from the characters, I'd like to talk about the stylistic inspiration for the environments. Um, so before we even brought on our talented art team, it was important for us to establish a strong visual language for the house itself. Our narrative designer described the futuristic mansion in the game as a strange ode to postmodernism and Western capitalism bathed in eye-popping neons. So we tapped into a couple of different uh, sources for inspiration to create that look, which I'll go over in the next few slides. So to give the mansion a little bit of that old world glamour, we added geometric gold ornamentation to the doors and walls that harkens back to the elegance of Art Deco. Another big influence was MTV Cribs. Rich people don't always have good taste and we wanted our environments to have this oppressive gaudiness at times. Hyperpop was another big influence. Hyperpop music is pop music taken to its most logical extreme. It's plastic, synthetic, slippery, and at times ethereal. We listened to a lot of this music while we were putting the game together, and the futuristic slickness of the environments really reflects that. Of course, Vaporwave and Seapunk were also big influences. The thing we love about these aesthetics is the feeling of context collapse inherent in them. The digitized brokenness, retro nostalgia, marble statues, ambivalent relationship with consumerism, and ocean mo motifs present in these aesthetics figure heavily into Hollow Vista's style. So of all the influences that I've covered so far, um, most have been from the past couple of decades. Art Deco was a little bit old, but for the most part, they're all pretty contemporary. But one of our biggest influences goes back to the fifth century BC. This one is more of a conceptual influence and it starts with a Greek poet named Simonides. So one day Simonides was reading a poem commissioned by a rich patron. Surrounded by expensive marble statues, Simonides read the poem out loud uh, for guests at a banquet hall, not too dissimilar from the environments of Hollow Vista. In fact, historians describe this particular patron as having a penchant for vain displays of wealth. The patron didn't like the poem. He told Simonides right after he performed it that he would only be paying him for half of it. Simonides then stepped outside for just a moment. At that time, the ceiling of the banquet hall collapsed. The patron and several of his guests perished. When the wreckage was cleared, the bodies were so disfigured that nobody could identify them. Nobody except for Simonides. He could remember exactly who was who, not because he knew these people well, but because he remembered where each person had sat when he performed his poem. Simonides had made an important discovery that you can memorize information very well by visualizing it as a point in physical space. This memorization strategy became known as the memory palace. So Hollow Vista is an immersive story about memories buried in physical space. We tend to think of immersive storytelling as something modern, something that has only come about with the advent of technology, but people have been trying bold experiments in storytelling for centuries. I'd like to end this talk on another piece of immersive storytelling, also inspired by the Memory Palace. This one was designed more than 500 years ago. It's the Theater of Memory, an ambitious installation by a Renaissance era mystic named Giulio Camillo. Camillo wanted to invent, he wanted to invert the stage and the audience. So he designed this experience that put a single spectator right in the center of the stage where the actors would normally be. Instead of auditorium seating, the sole explorer is surrounded on all sides by rows of painted doors. The spectator, could open any, the spectator could open any of the doors and explore the installations that lay beyond. Camillo designed areas filled with drawers, boxes, and coffers containing images, archives, and paintings representing mythology, philosophy, art, science, and mysticism. He called this theater an artificial mind, and it prefigures nonlinear storytelling and interactive media. Camillo didn't think of his theater of memory as entertainment or even as art. It was meant to be a ritual that spiritually transformed the people that walked through it. 
that's similar to the story arc that Carmen undergoes in our game Hollow Vista. It would be bold of me to claim that our game could also do this for the player, but I will say that to me, this is really the power of immersive art at its best. I think that at its most potent, immersive experiences can heal, transform, and illuminate. So I hope that this talk helps you find some inspiration for your own immersive works. And now I'd like to open it to the Q&A, bring back Star, and answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump in real quick here. So folks, um, feel free to use the chat feature to ask your question. And then um, once you do, I can also just pull you into this sidebar here so that you can unmute and ask your question directly too. But thank you so much, that was incredible. Um, thank you for having us. Yeah, I know, I love the aesthetic and I love the inspiration in the story. All right, I think we have one from Richard. I'll take this one. Um, so Richard says, what was the biggest challenge in developing your game in terms of implementing the tech? And I would say uh, probably there, there was a surprise in the middle of development, which is that uh, Apple changed the way permissions for the gyroscope worked in the middle of development. So we had to do a bunch of stuff to regain access to the gyroscope in the middle of dev. And that was just a big challenge. Yeah, the reason Apple changed permissions for the gyroscope is because some hackers figured out a way to determine passwords based on like slight tilts to your phone as you were typing. They could like map that to like which keys on a keyboard were pressed. So Apple disabled access to the gyroscope in certain contexts to prevent that kind of exploit from happening. But unfortunately, it made it a lot harder for us to implement the gyroscope in a simple way. That took a solid month to fix. Yeah. I'm glad it happened in the middle of development and not like the week before we launched. Yeah, that would have been pretty cool. <laughs> So Bina asks, what program did you use to create 3D space and design? Um, we used Cinema 4D for all of our scenes by Maxon. Hi, Scott. Scott's our game designer. Hey, Scott. All right. Um, oh, I got a, another question from Richard. All right. So I'll, I'll just read these out loud because um, I know you can't read them, Nadia. Um, did you go in knowing exactly how you were going to use the AR aspect or did something change as you saw it in practice slash development? Ooh, that's a really good question. Do you want to take a start? I took the last one, so you can have this one. Sure. Um, so we had the camera mechanic from the very beginning. So that was like one of the first things that we figured out. So we had this game where we were like, great, like you can take photos in these alternate environments. What can we do with that? And our initial idea was very ambitious. I'm really glad we didn't build it, but it was this notion of a completely nonlinear story where the photo that you chose to take and post opened up new story branches. So an example of that, we had this like really early narrative where your character was an influencer and you're staying in this hotel that was sponsored. And on one side you have this like beautiful tableau of like flowers and uh, you know, just decorative things. And on the other side, there's like a roach. So, what you chose to photograph and post kind of informed your relationship with like whoever sponsored you to go on that trip. Um, the unfortunate thing is that when we play tested it, 
from the player's perspective, the experience felt so linear that they didn't really understand the choice space. So from our perspective, there was this like rich tapestry of roads you could go down. But from the player's perspective, they were like, okay, so I take pictures and things happen. The end, you know? So we quickly realized that that was a little bit too, like, too much work for us in exchange for not enough, um, like, excitement for the player. And that's when we changed it to be much more puzzle-based and introduced the hidden object gameplay into the camera. The next question is, what did the first prototype look like? Which we sort of just answered. Um, Maybe we can pull up some screenshots and paste them in the chat later. Yeah, I'll say that the story for the first prototype was a lot more um, close to our world. It dealt with, you know, it dealt a lot more with the problems that we face when dealing with social media. And we felt that it hit a little bit close to home because social media already felt so dystopian in our world that like playing a game about how dystopian social media is like made people tired. So we chose a more fantasy based narrative that dug deeper into, you know, dreams and memories and took place further out into the future. In terms of color palette, the earlier prototypes were a lot more purple and had a lot more gradient. Star, do you want to talk about some of the design decisions you made on the aesthetic side for how the app looked? Yeah, I mean, I think in the original version, it was a little bit more, um, like Nadia said, like present times rather than future. So uh, it was a bit less fantastical in the way it presented itself. Um, and the focus was really on like this question of like, what kind of choice do you have when you're taking pictures and posting them? And like, what is the consequence of what you choose to share of yourself? Um, that was kind of like the core of the idea initially. And we just kind of went in another direction with regards to how we expressed that idea, just because it was pretty invisible to the player and not really achieving its goal. So when we moved into the more like futuristic story, especially as we figured out that it was gonna be about an architecture firm, um, there was a lot of inspiration there that came from architecture and came from the idea of like, what are exciting types of buildings that we have been in? And like, what are the kinds of things that we're excited to see um, in like the fantasy of what a rich person's house looks like? Like a lot of, um, a lot of what Carmen's expectations are going into the auto house for the first time are that it is a mansion. And so what you see through Carmen's eyes initially is like her idea of what a rich person's house is supposed to look like, which is in fact a caricature. Um, and so a lot of the aesthetic choices that we made were leaning in that direction of like, you know, what What does a mansion look like crossed with a selfie museum? Like, how much inspiration can we take from like interior design Pinterest boards and these sort of like um, oppressively slick presentations of things that are sometimes bordering on gaudy? And how do we uh, sort of manipulate those aesthetics to our advantage for the player's like emotional experience going through it? Very cool. I have a I have a follow up question to that. So, yeah. I think the inspiration and some of the messages behind the experiences you've created is like super. I don't know. I, I liked how you described there was a decision about how a game around social media is actually exhausting because social media is exhausting to your users. Like, what are some and what I really loved about what you've created is this like slightly subversive message that's coming across. What are some of those like takeaways that you want people to maybe think twice about or just like consider maybe upon, upon playing Hollow Vista? Ooh, that's a really good question. Star, do you want to both answer this? Yeah, how about you start and I'll follow up. Yeah, um, I think that a lot of 
near future sci-fi has this message of like, what if technology bad? Like, you know, like yeah. I am a huge fan of Black Mirror, but like generally speaking, I think there's this like Luddite message, but not a lot of um, things being offered as alternatives that are actually viable or interesting. And I think that the message of Hollow Vista isn't like delete social media. Um, there was like one review uh, where the reviewer summed it up as like, the message of Hollow Vista isn't to log off. It's like log on after you've had some therapy. So um, we think that like definitely in our game technology goes wrong for sure. But um, we also show how Carmen kind of makes the best of it going wrong and the way in, a, in which it goes wrong teaches her a lot about herself. So um, I think that we're in a situation where we can't just unplug it. We can't. Mm -hmm. We need to, you know, do our best within these systems. We need to go into these systems, many of which are quite oppressive with like deep self-knowledge. We need to have like really good boundaries with these systems, but you know, we have to coexist with them and we have to like try to nudge them in a positive direction. So that's kind of like, I mean, Hall of Vista has so many different threads, so many different motifs. There's a lot of stuff about poverty and religion and family relationships. But um, when it comes specifically to technology, we didn't want to tell an anti-technology story. Yeah, like, I think for me, like, one of the tenets that we kind of held throughout development was to be remade, we must first come apart. And the idea behind that had to do with like, social media is so much about identity and also so much about like aesthetic and beauty. And I think what we were trying to really show was the duality of those things. Like we get to decide who we are and how we portray ourselves. And we also get to decide like how we view the world around us and um, how we want to share that with other people and you know Carmen really needs to do some real uh soul searching and needs to know herself and in order to do that she needs to kind of tear down some of the stories that she has about who she is and examine it from another angle and so really like aesthetically we were trying to explore the idea that like your identity is something that you define and that has multiple sides and that, you know, you contain multitudes, um, an entire palace worth, mm -hmm. mansion worth, mm -hmm. right? So those were the themes that we were really trying to explore and talk about and express in like more subtle aesthetic ways instead of just directly saying like, social media is complicated and so is your identity, right? Amazing. Yeah. Thank you both for that. I think those are incredible sort of insights and, and yeah, awareness and ways to look at um, these like representations of ourselves and how we see ourselves and how we play with that. Um, okay. We have a question from Xavier. Hello. Hello. Hi, Xavier. Hi. Hey, uh, my question for you, I've been following the project for a few months and I couldn't play the game because I got the demo, but I don't have an iPhone. So I sent it to my girlfriend. I'm like, please play this and like, tell me how it is. Uh, but what was, is this the first game slash interactive experience that either of you two have made? This is the first big game that we've made. We did mm -hmm. some, you know, smaller prototype things earlier, a lot of like live event stuff. We ran a AR live event game in a bookstore at XOXO Fest the first year that we were a company, for example. But this is the first big thing that we've shipped. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we've got another question from Alexandra. Um, I wanted to ask what your process was for translating some of those complex themes into the gameplay. I know you mentioned some was um, part of the story itself and then some was the aesthetic. Um, I was curious about kind of your, your process for doing that. 
Nadia, do you want to take this? Because I took the last couple. Um, so I just want to make sure that I understand the question. The question was, how do we translate? I think I missed like, translate what to what? Like the idea in our head to the visuals or the visuals to the gameplay? Um, specifically the the themes that you guys just discussed, um, the social media, the, the um, kind of being torn down to be rebuilt, some of those like really big picture storytelling components and how those made um, kind of how you decided to have some of those maybe be more explicit in the game versus um, I think Star mentioned having some of those be more subtle aesthetic cues. Um, and that might be a really big yeah. question. No, so that's, can... a great, that's a great question. Uh, thank you for clarifying. Um, well, it was a hugely collaborative process and I actually want to give a huge sh shout out to Scott who's in the chat, our brilliant game designer. Um, when you have a team working on something like this, it's very important that everybody knows what everybody else is thinking. And Scott really introduced a level of rigor to our documentation that still astonishes me. So um, when you're working together on a team, you have to document things and you have to discuss them and you have to like commit them to paper so that everybody knows what everyone else is thinking. And through the discussions that come when you document, a lot of the like paradoxes and incongruities and misalignments kind of get worked out through you know, questions and answers. So at every stage of the process, there were conversations and there was reference. So there were a lot of pieces of media that inspired us some of them from the gaming world, like the game Mist. some of them from completely beyond the gaming world, like the book House of Leaves. So we made it a point to kind of share our inspirations. And um, at every point in the process, there was a lot of feedback. There was a lot of like, you know, our narrative designer would say, hey, I wrote a high level concept based on these ideas, does this match? So we would have a discussion about it, talk about what worked in that concept, what didn't work. Then, you know, hey, we took that high level concept and broke it down into like a chapter by chapter story, does that work? Hey, we put together a mood board, let's show it to the narrative designer, Strix, and get her feedback on whether these visuals match what she was picturing. So just a ton of conversation and documentation and eventually that becomes a conversation with the players. So we get to a point where we think that we've communicated the concepts, but we play test and it turns out that people are getting something totally different than what we intended or certain themes aren't coming through as clearly. So that's another layer to that iterative process um, of making sure that people are picking up what we're putting down. So, um, TLDR, lots and lots and lots of iteration with, you know, discussions and documentation al along the way.